Hey guys, welcome back to the Friday Q&A. As a follow-up to last week's Q&A, or a part two to the sunscreen questions, today I'm going to be addressing all of your questions on, with regards to the safety of sunscreens, the safety of uh, dihydroxyacetone and sunless tanners, as well as sunscreen in children. So if you're new here, welcome. My name is Andrea. I'm a dermatologist. I film day in the life of a dermatologist vlogs as well as sit down skincare related content similar to this video. So if this interests you, I uh, encourage you to stick around and with that, let's get started. An ideal sunscreen is one that would protect you from wavelengths of ultraviolet light that come from the sun and damage the skin as well as increase the risk of skin cancer. These wavelengths of light include UVB, which is the wavelength that results in a sunburn, as well as UVA, the wavelength of sunlight that, while not a major contributor to a sunburn, lowers our immune system, damages the deeper layers of our skin, and contributes to aging and an increased risk of skin cancer. One thing you'll appreciate is that the other component of an ideal sunscreen is it has to feel good going on, otherwise you're not going to want to use it. It should have a pleasing sensory and tactile profile. That would enhance compliance. All right, and so sunscreens fall into the categories of chemical sunscreens and physical sunscreens. And I described the differences between these two in my last Q&A, which I suggest you check out if you missed it. Chemical sunscreens, also known as organic sunscreens, are UV filters and include ingredients like avabenzone, oxybenzone, and octinosalate, to name a few. They function by absorbing ultraviolet light and dissipating it as heat. And so one of the most frequently asked questions that I get with regards to these UV filters is, I've heard that these ingredients are not stable and can degrade. Is that something I should be worried about? Most of the UV filters present in sunscreens are in fact stable. The exceptions to this are avabenzone and octinoxate, O-C-T-I-N-O-X-A-T-E. Avabenzone is a filter that does a very good job of filtering out UVA. However, it's pretty unstable. It requires the presence of other UV filters to ensure its stability in sunscreen. Avabenzone and octinoxate are chemical filters that, when combined together, can enhance the degradation of one another. So are these degradation products dangerous? No, they're not dangerous. Aside from inadequate protection against UV light, degraded filters pose no harm to human health. However, this shortcoming of chemical or organic sunscreens is one that is worth taking note of. Better option for you might be a physical sunscreen or a mineral sunscreen, also known as an inorganic sunscreen that contains the ingredients zinc and or titanium dioxide only. So the next question that I get is, I'm really worried. I've heard the ingredients in a lot of chemical sunscreens are dangerous to human health. Are the ingredients in chemical sunscreen safe? So the safety of UV filters has to be demonstrated in an extensive program of toxicologic studies. In Europe and Japan, these UV filters are regulated as cosmetics, whereas in the United States, they're regulated as over-the-counter drugs, and in Australia, they're regulated as therapeutic drugs. Australia and Europe have the most UV filters. By contrast, the United States has the fewest. UV filters have shortcomings in that they're not stable with time, as I mentioned in my last Q&A, and they need to be reapplied consistently. And the ideal UV filter is is something that is still in development. I realize that many of you uh, watching my videos um, are viewers in other countries. The way sunscreens are regulated, as I just mentioned, are, differs in, in each country. Um, but uh, do know this, uh, one ingredient, one UV filter ingredient that is not uh, available here in the United States is something called Biscotrizol, B-I-S-C-O-T-R-I-Z-O-L-E known as Tinosorb. This seems to be the most efficient and effective broad spectrum ultraviolet filter, but it is not available here in the United States. If chemical sunscreens have all of these shortcomings, then why don't we just use uh, physical sunscreens that contain zinc and or titanium dioxide only? I agree and advocate choosing those. However, 
A shortcoming of those ingredients is that they're not as cosmetically appealing. They tend to leave a white film, as you're probably keenly aware. They don't blend well with makeups, as you're keenly aware. And if you have a darker skin type, they're rather unsightly to wear. So in an effort to give them more of an aesthetic appeal, sunscreen developers are making use of micro size and nanoparticle technology to make these physical sunscreens cosmetically more pleasing and aesthetically more refined. One question that I get over and over is, I hear oxybenzone is dangerous. Is that something I should be worried about? I've read studies that it's a potential endocrine disruptor. Should I avoid it? Is this systemically absorbed? These kinds of questions. So oxybenzone is a chemical filter in sunscreens that has been present in the, that has been in use in the United States since the 70s. We have absolutely no evidence of any untoward effects towards human health with this ingredient. In laboratory studies, in other words, in studies on cells in a dish or in small animal models, there is some evidence to suggest that oxybenzone has the potential to function as an endocrine disruptor. Specifically, a handful of laboratory studies have demonstrated this ingredient has estrogen-like effects which could be dangerous. So given these laboratory studies, several human studies have been conducted to examine this potential risk. And what these studies in humans actually did demonstrate is that yes, oxybenzone can be absorbed systemically by humans when applied to the skin in a sunscreen. It can be excreted subsequently in the urine. However, these studies showed no concerning endocrine effects or effects on human health with use of oxybenzone containing sunscreens. Still worried? Understandably so. Avoiding it might be prudent, but do know that we lack data or evidence to suggest that this is harmful to you. So if you choose to avoid it, select a physical sunscreen like a zinc and or titanium dioxide only sunscreen to eliminate this theoretical concern. The second ingredient that I get numerous questions about is the ingredient retinyl palmitate. Is this dangerous? Retinyl palmitate is a vitamin A derivative. It is frequently added to sunscreens and has garnered quite a bit of attention in the media as a dangerous ingredient. However, analysis of all the laboratory studies and animal studies, as well as substantial experience with use of this ingredient in humans, fails to provide any compelling evidence that retinyl palmitate is a carcinogen. Furthermore, the medical community has a long-standing history of using both oral and topical vitamin A derivatives with absolutely no evidence that they cause cancer. And in fact, the opposite is true. These vitamin A derivatives have been shown to prevent cancers like skin cancer and are also treatments for cancers. So in summary, no, there is no evidence that retinyl palmitate is harmful or carcinogenic to humans. Now I, I mentioned that in an effort to make the physical sunscreens more cosmetically appealing, sunscreen developers are using nanoparticles. Are nanoparticles safe? Can they be absorbed? Should I be worried? Numerous studies have examined the safety of nanoparticles to humans in both sunscreens and various cosmetics. They only penetrate the stratum corneum, which is the very, very top layer of the skin. This is sort of like the roof of your house, um, the shingles layer. If something gets stuck in the shingles of your roof, you're really not concerned that it's going to fall all the way down into the basement. Likewise, nanoparticles getting kind of stuck in the stratum corneum of the skin, there's no reason or evidence that they actually are absorbed into the deeper layers of the skin. And a large body of human studies indicates that their use in sunscreens and cosmetics does not pose any risk to human health. If you're still worried, my recommendation would be avoid putting nanoparticle containing cosmetics or sunscreens on cuts, open sores, areas where the skin barrier or your roof is impaired. But regardless, there's no data at this time that these nanoparticles pose any threat to human health. Are sunscreens containing antioxidants better? And should I spend extra money on a sunscreen that contains an antioxidant? So antioxidants, things like vitamin C, are added to sunscreens with the theoretical idea that they can add a little bit of protection against the damaging free radicals that ultraviolet light exposure causes. 
However, a 2011 study published in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology examined many popular sunscreens claiming to have antioxidants, and this study demonstrated that these sunscreens had negligible to no antioxidant capability. This is likely owing to the fact that antioxidants are very unstable in cream forms and forms applied to the skin. So bear that in mind the next time that you're thinking about buying a cosmetic or a cream that claims to contain antioxidants. So I've discussed some of the most common ingredients that you guys seem concerned about in your questions, but I will address kind of one global concern that continues to arise. People continue to ask me, Dr. Dre, have you not seen the Environmental Working Group's Guide to Sunscreens? This guide claims that sunscreens are dangerous, sunscreen ingredients can cause human disease, and that sunscreen SPF labeling is a complete lie. What are your thoughts on that? So the Environmental Working Group puts out a guide to sunscreens, and they rate popularly sold sunscreens based on whether or not they think the ingredients in these sunscreens cause cancer or reproductive harm in humans. They rate these sunscreens as low, medium, and high hazard. This report is not published in any medical journal. It does not undergo any form of rigorous peer review by researchers, but it is regularly referenced in top media outlets Despite criticism from the medical community at large regarding the shortcomings and lack of transparency in rating from these sunscreens. And what I'll point out is that no media outlet seems to be covering the fact that every single one of the supposed environmental working group approved sunscreens comes from, a company, comes from companies that contribute significant financial support to the overall sunscreen campaign of the environmental working group. And their, their criticisms against the high level of SPF is something that here in the United States is being addressed by the FDA, who is attempting to refine regulations on the limit of SPF, simply because we know that SPFs much higher than 50 don't really offer any additional benefit. So sunscreens claiming to be, you know, 99 or 100 plus, are somewhat misleading in that they suggest that their sunscreen may be better than a lower SPF. But this is being addressed, and regardless, that doesn't make that sunscreen useless. So the environmental working group continues to stir up this media frenzy, scaring consumers against sunscreens. But the truth? You don't need to spend $30 on an environmental working group safe all natural sunscreen to protect yourself from the sun. And as I've said, we have no evidence that sunscreen ingredients sold in the United States and in other countries pose any threat to human health. All right, so moving away from sunscreen ingredients, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the question that I get frequently with regards to sunless tanners specifically the ingredient dihydroxyacetone. Is this safe? Dihydroxyacetone, or DHA, is the ingredient added to sunless tanners. It's a color additive that binds to proteins in the top layer of the skin and imparts a color change. We have no evidence that sunless tanners containing DHA cause any threat to human health. Now there are some studies that show if you apply very, 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 very high concentrations of DHA on the skin, it can form damaging free radicals. However, the concentration of DHA in over-the-counter sunless tanners doesn't even come close to this level. I will point out that we don't know how safe it is in spray tan forms. So if you're going into a spray tan booth, one recommendation, just for added comfort, since we don't know, and it's reasonable to have concern when we don't know. Make sure you cover your eyes or close your eyes to avoid getting it into the eyes. Um, hold your breath, because we don't know if there are any potential dangers to inhaling this. And close your mouth so that you don't ingest it. Make sure you cover your lips with Vaseline and then remove the Vaseline after the spray tan. To avoid getting DHA onto your lips and mucosal surfaces of the mouth. All right, so lastly, I'll touch on sunscreen use in children. So I will underscore the fact that up to 80% of our lifetime sun exposure occurs in early childhood. Childhood is a particularly vulnerable time for the cancer-causing effects of ultraviolet light from the sun. 
sun protection in early childhood and adolescence is imperative. People who report a history of a bad sunburn in early childhood have an increased incidence of melanoma, the deadliest form of skin cancer. Regular use of sunscreen during childhood and adolescence can decrease an individual's lifetime risk of non-melanoma skin cancers, which include squamous cell and basal cell cancer, can decrease the risk of formation of those non-melanoma skin cancers by estimates of 78%. So children over the age of two, like adults, should use sunscreens as an additional measure of sun protection. I emphasize additional. It should not be the sole method of sun protection. In next week's q and I'm going to go over some of your most frequently asked questions about uh, how often to apply sunscreen and how much. And in that video, I will talk about additional measures of sun protection that are important for you to know. But suffice it to say that sunscreen is not adequate on its own as a sun protective measure. It is an additional measure that should be put into place. With regards to infants and children under the age of two, one thing to know is the very top layer of their skin is immature and developing. If you'll remember back to my analogy of the top of our skin being like a roof, infants really don't have much of, much of their shingles laid down just yet. Importantly, infants and very young children are at the highest risk for the untoward effects of sun exposure because of their immature baby skin. So mothers, fathers, grandparents, community members, Protect that baby skin. <laughs> the best measure is covering your baby in thick weave fabrics, protecting their bodies from the sun. The thinner the top layer of the skin, or in an infant's case, the immaturity of the top layer of the skin, may add to your concern about any potential systemic absorption of sunscreens. Therefore, a conservative and prudent recommendation is to use physical sunscreens solely to any exposed areas of the body, such as their little hands or their little face. But please, please, please protect that baby skin. Um, it is so susceptible and so uh, precious uh, at, at that time. Again, I apologize, I can't comment on sunscreens in other countries, but here in the United States, sunscreens marketed as safe for babies are fantastic. I happen to be a fan of this Aveeno one. It is zinc oxide only. All right, so that's gonna wrap up this week's Q&A on your questions about sunscreen safety and sunscreen safety ingredients. Next week's q and I'm going to go over the most frequently asked questions, how much sunscreen to apply and how often, as well as uh, expectations for sun protection, which are which I think will be which I think are, are very relevant uh, given this time of year where we're all headed to the beach. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and as always, don't forget sunscreen and subscribe. I'll talk to you guys in my next Q and A. Bye. <laughs>